again um, and we'll be talking a little bit about the administration, what it will take for you to do well in this class um, and then um, I'll move over to perception. Um, so we'll be talking um, about how does our visual system work, what are the caveats that we have to take care of and I've also prepared an exercise. Um, so I'm guessing that we probably won't be finishing up with perception and that we will do that again next Thursday and from now on We'll be always doing Tuesdays for the next couple of weeks will be a technical lecture and then Thursdays is going to be like a theory lecture. This is going to happen for at least six or seven weeks now. Um, and so if you, for example, are really proficient in HTML and CSS and SVG, next Tuesday is not going to be very exciting for you. But I also still want to cover it because I don't want to lose anybody. Um, and then the week afterwards, we'll talk about JavaScript, about ES6, what you can all do, uh, do with JavaScript. And then we'll be starting to talk about uh, to working with D3 um, in terms of technical content. Okay. So here are my stated course goals. Like I want to teach you, and you should be learning how to efficiently visualize. How you can apply fundamental principles and techniques. Uh, how you can design visual data analysis solutions and design both from a, like kind of talking to pre people to understand their problems and their goals to coming up with sketches to refining those sketches to realizing this in a prototype and then finally also implement them uh, as interactive data visualization and so as a side effect you will be acquiring some web development skill in this class and we will be teaching some web development um, as I already mentioned we have these different course components the lectures introduce theory and the design critiques, like what I've prepared here, are really here for you to develop an eye for design, to really think critically about visualizations because before you can actually do a good visit, like create a good visualization yourself, you have to know what makes the visualization good and bad. Um, then we'll have the labs, uh, which will be um, Wednesdays. Um, so we will have one lab next Wednesday. Uh, this lab will introduce the homework one, which will be like a very simple SVG plots manually created. Um, so Carolina will go through the homework um, and she will uh, then give you an exercise which is similar to the homework that you can do while you're there um, and um, ask questions. Again, this is going to be pretty simple, so if you're like a CS major in your fourth year, um, then this might not be that exciting for you. Um, then, of course, we have the homeworks. As I already mentioned, there's going to be six homeworks, four easy and short ones for a week. Really, really easy at the beginning, but continuously getting more difficult. And the fifth and the sixth home homework will be you creating multiple coordinated view visualization projects uh, that will be a lot more intricate. You'll be creating maps, you'll be create, like, you'll have use interactivity, and those will be two week homeworks, uh, and they will be weighted higher, and you'll need a lot more time to complete them. And then your final project gives you a chance to go through a complete visualization project. I'll be talking more about the project uh, at some future time. But essentially, it's a team project. You should team up with two to uh, three people. Um, and um, then you find your own data set. You develop a visualization de design proposal that you hand that in to us. We give you feedback. You develop a milestone um, that is functional in some way. Uh, you hand that in, we give you feedback, and then you develop the final version of the project. And the project is pretty important in terms of grades um, because it's for 40% of your grades. Um, I also mentioned this uh, already quite a bit. So um, you will develop your uh, uh, design skills, your coding skills, and you'll learn about the visualization theory. And so we have these design studios, what I call these critiques. 
uh, and you will be also asked to redesign something today, and we might have a lecture on design. Um, for coding skills, there's the labs, there's the technical lectures that I'll be teaching, there's the reading, uh, and of course, as, every, as always, when you program, you need to do it yourself, and you need to fail and make it better and look up and stack overflow, uh, and so on. And then, of course, we'll be starting office hours next week, um, where you can go and ask questions. And the theory will be conveyed in lectures, like I'm doing it right now, and in the readings. Um, as, um, as you can see, like, we have a lot of recommended readings, and we also have a mandatory textbook. I would really recommend the textbook, especially for people uh, like to follow that closely and to read it closely, who have like, a deeper interest. Because it's very well written, it's very dense, but it's well written and it's very comprehensive. Okay, um, you, like if you're on, like there is a YouTube channel, as I already mentioned, where we all will collect all of the videos that are being recorded here. Um, there, it, this is also streamed live, um, and so you can revisit any of those lectures. Um, and in terms of content, we will have like three different, like essentially, sections, whereas the first two here are a little bit interwoven. So we have technical foundations where we'll talk about from everything from HTML to V3. Um, the visualization fundamentals, like we'll do today, perception, and other simple, uh, similar things. And then uh, we have um, abstract data visualization, and things like how do you visualize a table, how do I visualize graphs, how do I visualize maps, how do I deal with interaction techniques, um, and so on. So these are kind of the main components. There will be additional lectures that don't really fit that well in any of the three parts. Um, you've probably seen the website by now. Please do take a look at the syllabus and read it. Um, and I also, I think, mentioned this before. There is a companion course. So up to last year, um, I taught both abstract data visualization, things like maps, uh, graphs, and text, and so on, and scientific data visualization in this one course, uh, which was just like a very, very dense program for especially the scientific visualization. And so then we decided that we have seven faculty who all do research and visualization. We have a lot of people who uh, are in the graphics and visualization tag, for example, and therefore we want to kind of like give a deeper introduction into both topics and separate them out. So there is the uh, visualization for scientific data taught by Chris Johnson, which will be first offered in the spring. And so there you will learn things like how to visualize an MRI image, how to visualize tensor in a spatial field, tensors in a spatial field, how to visualize flow data, how do I visualize large-scale uh, simulation data, for example, like combustion engines and so on, these kinds of things. Um, you the Slack channel for like the, the public channels for all of these general questions. Obviously, don't post, post solutions uh, for code, but feel free to ask questions. And therefore then, both the TAs and I and your fellow students can help you out. Um, use email for personal inquiries. So like permission codes, or I'm sick for um, whatever, like for this exam, or anything like that where you have something personal, to discuss, please email me directly. Please don't use Slack for that, because my email, like I keep better track of my email than of Slack. Um, for submissions, for the homeworks, we'll be using the uh, Canvas system. We won't be using Canvas much for much else, so we'll have Slack for uh, communications, and um, we have the website for announcements and so on. Uh, so uh, the Canvas is mainly used for homework submissions and for grades. The projects will be submitted by simply like posting your a GitHub repository um, and tagging your release, um, and that so we will won't be submitting uh, projects via Canvas. Uh, my office hours are Wednesdays at 2 p.m. My office is at in this building, um, third floor, 387. So feel free to come if you have questions about anything, or be it technical, be it theoretical, be it of a personal nature. Please go ahead and see me. Um, so these are the two required textbooks. Um, both of them are actually available uh, to read on your computer for free on campus, um, provided by the library. Um, this is the interactive data visualization. This is the old picture that is now was just published in version two, like a second edition, um, just in end of August. Um, and that second edition is important because um, it, it, it covers D3 version four, which we'll be using compared to this, this book that covered D3 version three. 
So there are some subtle differences between those two, and so if you look at the second edition, you never have to worry about version 3. Um, and this is an academic textbook um, that really covers mostly information visualization in, in depth, um, and you will see that many of my like, slides are structured around this book. Um, in terms of programming, I mentioned this before, we will be developing everything in JavaScript. Uh, we'll be using the latest version of JavaScript, ECMAScript 6, with all the nice features. Um, and we will be using D3, uh, data-driven documents. I guess many of you might have heard of this very popular library. So, some of you, like, obviously, computer science, master's students, or undergrads, this course is clearly, like, you can clearly do well in this course. Um, but if you're a non-traditional student in this class, you should have some programming experience. So you should at least know, like, what is a function, what is a loop, what is an if statement, and so on. Um, so if you know C, C++, Java, Python, or something like that, you'll probably be fine. If you know JavaScript, you'll probably have a much easier time. Um, you also need a willingness to think about the user-centered design. This is not your average CS course, right? So we, it's going to be hard for us to simulate real users, but we'll be trying. Um, so we care about the human in the loop. Um, you will have to have a willingness to learn new software and tools. While we'll be teaching you technology, it's, it's going to be time intensive to simply get everything to work. So just be aware that this might happen. Um, and you will need to build skills uh, by yourself. Um, so you'll be like trying uh, things out and like, how do I pass events between those different views and so on. We won't be explicitly teaching that. Uh, you should be uh, properly equipped with, by based on your prior experience to do these kind of things. Okay, here are a couple of formalities. I mentioned this uh, already with the six homework assignment. The final project is 40%. Um, and then the exams, we'll have two exams every like Thursday before the uh, fall break and the Thursday before uh, uh, the finals week. So that will be at like in lecture time, it will be in person here on paper and they will cover essentially what we covered in that period. So the midterm essential will cover everything up to that point and the final exam will not cover the whole course but only the second part. In both cases, you will be asked to uh, critique a visualization and to redesign a visualization. So there's a creative part to it too. So bring your pencils and um, anything that you need to draw. Um, obviously, uh, we don't want you to cheat. We want, to do, want you to do your own work. Please do make sure um, that there is no ambiguity. You are absolutely welcome to help each other, to discuss ideas, to discuss problems, to show somebody this is my code, this isn't working, working, can you help me out? That is totally fine, but you cannot have the same piece of code submitted, ever. And we'll be automatically checking for plagiarism in all of your submissions. Um, so you must write your own code, and if, like for the homeworks, you should never use any other resources, like you cannot copy code from anywhere online. For the projects, we're a little bit more lenient because we want you to build something in a realistic environment. Um, I already discussed this a bit on Slack. Um, I would like you guys to like, not use your devices if, when you're in here. The reason for that is like twofold. A, there's research uh, that shows that, for example, if you want to take notes and you do that by hand, that you retain a lot more. So you, um, you actually learn more if you take notes by hand. And the reason for that is that all of you are probably great typers and you don't really have to go through an abstraction process. Um, when you uh, type, whereas you have to go through an abstraction process when you handwrite because you're just not as fast at doing that. Um, and the other thing is, of course, I'm aware that I'm not as funny as whatever you're seeing on Facebook right now. Um, and so it's hard for me to compete with some dancing kittens or whatever, uh, and especially notification from your friends and so on. Like all of these interfaces are designed to grab your attention, and there's like a little red thing flashing in the upper left corner of your upper right corner of your computer. You will simply look at it even if you don't want to. And so I would like you guys to pay attention. Um, you don't have to come; it's not mandatory attendance. I would love you to come, uh, but like if you're here, please don't use your computer. I'm not going to be strict about this. I'm not going to go to anybody and, and, and look into your, on your screen and say, hey, put this away. This is more like a strong recommendation than an absolute rule. Uh, and we will have the coding lectures 
where you're actually encouraged to follow along, to play with this, all of this is going to be interactive, so obviously there you will need your computers. Um, I hope most of you have already uh, completed Homework Zero, which includes all the course, course survey, and then today we have the lecture on perception, and you should also be reading chapters 1, 2, 3 in the D3 book, um, and chapter 1 in the visualization design and analysis book. Um, we will be pushing Homework out, Homework 1 out very soon, which is due next Friday. And then we will be doing on Tuesday, we'll be doing an introduction into Git and version control, uh, because you will be needing that for your project, um, into HTML and into CSS. And we won't be focusing on all of the different HTML elements, but we'll be looking at some things like selectors and so on. And we'll be starting office hours. Okay, and the homeworks are going to be published in this GitHub repository. Um, so what you can do is you can simply like have a local copy of the repository. Uh, there is also some description uh, somewhere on the website on how you can essentially fork that into your own repository and get updates. Uh, but essentially you can just download the homeworks from there. Uh, we usually give you a stop, uh, a stop of code in addition to introductions uh, that you can use to get started. And then um, we'll also pop, push updates. Sometimes we make mistakes. Uh, and if there's anything wrong, we'll simply push an update to GitHub and we'll post um, in, on Slack when there is something like that happening. Um, I also wanted, like some of you might have already heard that, but I kind of wanted to emphasize it because A, I'm involved in this track, B, and this is a class that is part of that. Um, there is a new track which is called Human Centered Computing. You actually probably won't even find it on the website yet, but it's going to be um, possible to take this track starting in the fall. Um, and this track has four required courses. One of them is this course. Um, the other one is Human-Computer Interaction, which is taught by Mariah Maya. Uh, and then there is um, a statistics course, which is taught by Education and Psychology Department. And it's introdu Introduction to Stats and Research Design. And so what's nice about this course is um, that you get to pick a very balanced curriculum, both um, teaching you computer science skills, so you have to take at least three CS electives, um, but you can also take stuff like ethnographic design, or digital fabrication, or advanced human cognition, or neuropsychology from other departments. So essentially to give you like, an opportunity to look beyond what is core CS and still get a computing degree. So that's the idea. And so if you want to know more about this, uh, please feel free to talk to me. And then I was also asked to introduce um, a data science club. So we are starting like a data science um, like many different data science initiatives, and one of them is this data science club, which is a club for students to participate. There's going to be events. Most of these events will have pizza. Um, and this, um, particularly, we'll have a kickoff event where we have six um, data scientists from industry come um, and give a, like, a, essentially have a panel be, be there to answer your questions. I'm not totally sure yet what exactly the program is, but you can find out more about this at this URL. Um, it's going to be uh, in Warner Gun Engineering building, um, and it will, there will be food. So this is the kickoff event. Um, I would recommend if you're interested at this in, uh, in this at all, just go there and learn what the Data Science Club is about. Okay, so this is my introduction, the formalities. Does anybody have any questions related to the structure of the course? If not, then we can talk about perception. Okay. So what, am I, what do I mean by perception? Well, there's two different things. There's perception and cognition. Uh, perception is the identification and interpretation of sensory from the physical stimulus, like the um, the electromagnetic uh, wave hitting your uh, retina uh, to recognizing the information. And the perception is not neutral, it's not absolute. It is very much shaped by your uh, learning, by your memory, by your expectations. And I'll have plenty of examples for what I mean by that in the rest of this lecture. Cognition, in contrast, is this higher level process, um, how we process information and apply knowledge. So we learn something. So good, good, um, the distinction between those two 
is if you hear somebody speak in a language that you don't know, for example, you perceive them to speak, but you don't know the language, hence you cannot um, understand what they're saying. So this is a perceptive process, not a cognitive process. But if you understand the language and the words, um, then the cognitive, the, the cognitive process is engaged. Um, so, like, these are just like a couple of keywords that are related to those two topics. The, in perception, we talk about the eye, the optical nerve, the visual cortex, basic perceptions, early processing, um, things like edges and planes, and it's usually not considered to be conscious. And all of us have also built-in reflexes, um, like as you all know, and I'll show a couple of examples how we can leverage these lower level reflexes essentially uh, for visualization too. Uh, and cognition is about recognizing objects, um, making sense of relationships between objects, uh, drawing conclusions, solving problems, learning, and so on. So this is a good example of perception versus cognition, right? So here we have a set a list of words that are that are that are there were their colors written out, but they are rendered in other colors than they are written. So essentially, looking at the colors is a perceptive process. Reading this and understanding, aha, uh -huh, yellow, the color, the text is written in blue, that's a cognitive process. So um, there is this difference uh, between what is there objectively in our environment and what do we see and perceive. Um, so for example, um, who can see something meaningful in this picture? To three or four people, five, six. Okay, so most people are getting it. This is a, like, you can see a Dalmatian here, a dog. So, like, here is the head of the dog, and here is the body, these are the legs. Um, and so this is like something really tricky that we can do because we recognize that object, right? If we didn't recognize that object, um, we would be having a really hard time of seeing something here. And this is also a hard problem for computer vision, obviously. Um, these are called emergence images, um, and this, this, like, once you have seen it, uh, then you cannot really unsee it, and this is called perceptual hysteresis. And so, there is research, we can see something here. Yeah, there's an elephant right here. Um, and so, <laughs> here's the trunk of the elephant, the ears, the legs. Um, and so this was actually a SIGGRAPH paper uh, from, from recent, like from 2009, a SIGGRAPH Asia paper, uh, and they did some studies on, on what is it that we perceive about those pictures. And so, like here it's quite obvious, the, the dog. There was a published algorithm um, that can generate those images. Um, but what is interesting is that we cannot, like this doesn't work if we only look at patches of an image, like here. Um, so we don't recognize those parts. Here this is like the trunk and these are the ears, but it's really hard to see for us. But if we do like a, a good rendering, this patch is very easily recognizable. So what this essentially tells us is that we need to like, know the object and kind of like, make sense of it um, as a whole. And there's also, they also did studies, um, like here particularly, this is like, there's somewhere the Stanford bunny in here. Oh no, there's like a, a, a figure in here. So you, you, this is like the same picture before and after I hover over it, but one time it flipped on its head. And only very few people actually identify a person in this picture when it's flipped on its head. So if there's a, a weird pose, we don't actually recognize these objects like that. And if we flip that around, exactly the same image, a lot of people, like 90% or so, um, identify it. Okay, um, again, an example of perception versus what is really there. Um, so we see it here, like, uh, we have like a 3D effect of this image, but in reality, of course, this only works because of the perspective. We, so we rely on our prior understanding of the world to interpret images. Um, here are a couple of other fun examples uh, that simply illustrate that point. Um, and we also tend to recognize things that we are very familiar with um, in things that, where they don't exist. So here are example, like to be faces, uh, but where we perceive them to be faces. And that's probably also the reason why sometimes you can see like a Jesus image in toast. <laughs> um, so what is the, why am I showing you this? Like the take home point here is that 
vision is constructed top down from the input. So what you see, when you see a thing, depends on what the thing is. What you see the thing as depends on what you know about what you're seeing. So our perception is not independent of our understanding of the world. We have these priors, we have these assumptions um, that we rely on to make inferences. And you'll see many other examples in this lecture. So let's talk a little bit about the fundamentals, uh, like the eye. And I'm not going to make this into a biology lecture. I'm going to focus on the things that are relevant to visualization and uh, related topics. So um, you've seen this in biology textbooks. What I really care about um, is um, our understanding for there is a difference between like, this, our central vision um, and peripheral vision. So we have the retina here in the back where a light is projected onto through the lens. And in the retina we have a central um, like the fovea, uh, or fovea, which is kind of like the point of our sharpest vision. And this is going to be important, I'll talk about uh, this later. And then we have, at one point in our retina, there's the optical nerve exiting, so we have these blind spots. There's a lot of um, examples on the internet that can illustrate how you can miss a point, for example, based on um, the, like the, your blind spots. So how does this work um, generally? Like we have about five to six million cones. Um, there's two different kinds of uh, photoreceptors. These are cones and rods. They're easy to remember because Cones, CO, uh, can see color. So like two, the two first uh, uh, um, letters are the same. Uh, so we have five to six million cones which are responsible for the color vision and they're really densest in the center of the eye around the fovea. Uh, fovea. So there is about uh, 27 times the density in the fovea uh, compared to other parts of the retina. And the fovea is responsible for sharp central vision. So here is this figure essentially shows us um, the relative frequency um, of, uh, of these um, perceptors and you can see it right here in the middle of the, like at the point where the uh, fovea is, we have like the highest density um, of uh, photoreceptors. And then we have about 120 million rods which are responsible for black and white vision. So here is like a good um, um, image, like a good illustration. Uh, a pretty old one actually, as you can see here, the rods that are sensitive to black and white, the cones that are sensitive for, to color vision. Um, how does it look like under an electron microscope? Um, so you can see the cones are much smaller and uh, the rods are, are much bigger here. Um, and we don't have, like we have a couple of different cones um, and not all of, like they are, they are sensitive to different frequencies of light and we have more red, like the most red ones fewer green ones and the fewest blue ones. So we are kind of weak at uh, discovering blue shades. Which is probably like the evolution, evolutionary reason is there's not a lot of blue in our environment, right? If you go into like a natural environment, like into a forest, you won't be seeing a lot of blue there. Um, yeah, so um, here this picture is quite kind of interesting. You essentially see that um, in the uh, fovea we have these very densely packed uh, cones and in the periphery we have uh, a mix between rods and cones. Um, and yeah, you can also see that like um, the distribution of the our color sensitivity isn't uh, equally spaced. Um, one other thing that you might not be aware of is that we actually have only a very very narrow uh, field of sharp vision. So it kind of like we don't perceive it like this. But if you can think of the whole visual perception process of more of like an ongoing construction project. Because we can simply, we, we, everything appears sharp to us because we can move our gaze around and then essentially construct that image. But what we, if we just fixated on one point, this is more like what we would perceive when, if we looked at a spreadsheet. So we see like a couple of numbers uh, really in focus here and then a couple of numbers in the surrounding environment, we can see them well, but up here, what the details are is not obvious um, unless we move our eyes. Um, and so, how that works is uh, we have these rapid, like interchanging operations between fixations and saccades. So, we fixate on a point, perceive it, and then move our eyeballs around. And this, like the moving of the eyeballs, is called the saccades. The fixations uh, last about 200 to 600 milliseconds. And the saccade, the moving between the different locations is about between 20 and 100 milliseconds.
cameras try to capture everything uh, at the same quality, but our vision is very much like we have a central good vision, uh, but we don't uh, see our like wider surroundings that well. Uh, and this here is an example of an eye tracking study. So we can essentially like by putting people in front of machines to track our move the movement of the retina, and by shining infrared light into their eyes and then using some computer vision, we can actually and carefully calibrating this. Like here is an example of such a setup. Um, and there's now a better, like this one is actually like a state-of-the-art one. This is a setup that you would use in a psychology experiment where it's really about high accuracy, whereas this here is an eye-tracking setup that you would use in a usability study, for example. If you want to see where do people look at your website or which parts of your uh, visualization interface do people pay attention to. Um, and so uh, what happens is like, um, what we can then essentially reconstruct the gaze path of peoples. And so I've prepared a video for that, which doesn't like to play. And again, the sound is a problem. Here is no sound, but this is like a, an aggregated study of what people look at when they see a commercial like this. Um, so there's, this is like a heat map, and I'll be playing it. So what you always see is that people tend to focus on human faces, um, and then on like text, uh, reading labels and so on. So this is aggregated for multiple people and now here I have one example of a guy singing karaoke while being eye tracked. And you can see he's basically erratic right now, no specific And you see very well that this is not like a continuous scan along the text or every letter, but essentially like one word for one word or how like two words and so on at, at, a, uh, at a sequence. And this is like a demo video by one of those vendors. Um, you can actually make those things with like pretty accurate precision, like for pretty cheap nowadays, um, but a professional system costs like $20,000. Okay. So here we have like infrared camera, then we have like a stimulus that could be a visualization that you're testing, um, and then um, there is like um, the, the software essentially tracks where you're looking at, um, and then either by fixating your head um, or by doing computer vision and head tracking, um, it can infer where you're actually looking at at the screen. Um, so um, I also wanted to like I emphasize this before, but um, there is, we don't really have general purpose vision. We always frame things in the context of what we perceive. And so there's this famous example, the Ames room. So this looks like a perfectly normal room, and then we have a person going into that room. And this is not, not somehow digitally altered. This is just relying on our assumptions of what a room looks like. Is it a different person? No, it's the same person. You'll, <laughs> <laughs> You'll see why. So it's not a rectangular shaped room. It's like a, um, here's a, a slide for it. It's a room where you essentially break with the conventions that we assume. Um, and then by, by carefully uh, controlling where you, like, what your perspective is, so you can't move your head around because of a video, or if you have just like a tiny hole to look through, uh, you can actually create this illusion. Uh, we perceive this room as rectangular. And so if we don't have other cues like uh, motion parallax, 
and so on, we simply have no way of, of resolving these ambiguities. Is that clear? Okay. Great. So, um, we will be talking a lot about color because color is one of the most important things in visualization and also the easiest. And in the future lectures, we'll be talking about how do we properly use color to encode data. Um, so what is color? It's first, it's a visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's between 390 and 750 nan nanometers wavelength. Um, and there it is, there are special colors, which are the spectral colors, which are evoked by a single wavelength. Most colors that we actually see are unsaturated colors. They're a mix of multiple wave wavelengths of multiple intensities. Um, and then we also have just like the stimulus without color, um, the grayscale. Um, so here you can see like the whole or like a part of the electromagnetic spectrum and you can see the human, uh, the visible spectrum for humans is this kind of like smallish uh, band right here. Um, color is not the same as wavelength. It's rather a combination of wavelength and energy. So here are two different examples that have both the peak at the same wavelength but, um, for example, we perceive uh, a signal like this, where the relative energy intensity is concentrated around this wavelength as yellow. Whereas we perceive, like, essentially a mix of wavelength with a, with a peak around yellow as brownish. So this is how color is constructed. And it turns out that color is irrelevant to much of normal vision. So you can be colorblind and not be significantly um, handicapped in, in our world. So it doesn't help you perceive the layout of object, it doesn't tell us anything about how things are moving, um, nothing about the shape, and those are kind of like the evolutionary important pieces. Uh, what color does though is it breaks camouflage, and so the, uh, like the theory is that color vision was developed, um, for example, to A, identify pre predator predators in like an environment so that they stand out, um, and also to, ju to judge material properties like the quality of the food so that we can easily perceive whether, uh, like if an apple is rotten, for example. Um, color has a couple of dimensions, and um, these are like, not quite so easy to tease apart, uh, but the obvious thing is hue. So hue is what we kind of, like if you talk about color colloquially, we usually mean color hue. Uh, so red, green, blue, and so on, like these, these are the, the different color hues. Um, then saturation is the purity of the color. So here we have, um, the same hue with different saturations. Um, the value, also called luminance or brightness, is the lightness or the darkness of a color. So high saturation colors have medium values. So what you really need to remember here, uh, there is a difference between hue and another component that essentially shows us like uh, something like the strength of the color. Um, and my audio setup isn't working, but this is an interesting Radio Lab uh, episode that you should uh, take a look at if you're interested in that. This kind of discusses our color vision and also the color vision of other animals like the dog, who has much worse color vision than we have, um, but other, other um, animals have much better color vision than we have. And so they, they do a really good job of discussing this. This is a great podcast, so I'd recommend that you listen to that. Um, and so. What is the role of objects in our color perception? Well, we perceive the color of objects because of their reflective prof properties. So if we are outside, the sun emits like a broad spectrum of wavelength, which we perceive as white. Um, but if something, like if, a, uh, if something bounces off an object, the, um, the physical properties of this object determine which uh, wavelength is being reflected. And that is what makes up colors. So this is the, what the difference is between how we perceive an orange and green apple and strawberries because they have different reflective properties. So, quiz. What are the primary colors? Red, green, blue, red, yellow, blue, orange, green, violet, cyan, magenta, yellow. Who thinks one? Who thinks two? Who thinks three? Who four? We don't have any printers here. <laughs> the answer is all of the above. <laughs> so it depends. Um, what does it depend on? Well, there's a couple of different ways of how we can create colors. We can mix paint by mixing physically opaque paints, like something that is not translucent. Um, and then we have 
uh, red, yellow, blue as our primary colors, or orange, green, uh, and violet as our colors. So these are subtractive colors using these reflective properties of material, as I just mentioned. If we have translucent colors, um, then this is like ink mixing, what happens in your, in your color printers if you have an inkjet uh, printer, for example. Um, so this is a subtractive mix of transparent inks. And here, cyan, magenta, and yellow are the primary colors. You can have secondary colors as red, green, blue, and then it also turns out that for ink mixing, it's hard to make proper. And this is a subtractive color scale. And then, um, as in our, all our digital devices, we, have, we mix light. Uh, so we don't mix um, any like, pigments, but instead we mix light. And so we have an additive mix of colored lights. And here the primary colors are red, green, and blue. Secondary colors are uh, cyan, magenta, magenta yellow. Um, and this is an additive process. So by adding two over uh, on top of each other, we get like a red, green, uh, creates yellow, uh, green, blue creates lighter blue, um, and then here we have like this violet, and then if we mix all of those three, we have white light. That yeah. doesn't look like blue, it looks more like purple. More like what? Purple. What's pur purple? Purple. Purple. Uh, yes. <laughs> so, this is actually a good point, and you will see that we can actually, like if we create a device, uh, we can actually choose our co primary colors. I'll be talking about how we can locate those colors in the gamut in a second. Um, right here, like this is the chroma chromaticity diagram. This is essentially like um, a, a convention for a diagram where we have the pure colors um, on the other side, like this here is better annotated. So this is essentially um, a representation. This is not actually, like you're not able to see the real colors here. Uh, because we are using a light mixing based three pigment ba uh, three color source based display, but conceptually, uh, what you have here on the outer edge are the true colors. Um, inside these diagrams are all the colors visible to the average human eye. Um, and then, in a, if we have a device like a monitor, we can pick three points as our like three pixels in our screen, and we can place them anywhere we would like to on this gamut. Of course, technical feasibility uh, permitting. Um, and so then, we can essentially only display the colors that are in this triangle by combining those. So we have, like, for example, if we want to show something very red, we only use this pixel, uh, but don't use any of those pixels. So we can mix them. But we cannot, by using these three pixels here, we cannot display colors outside of here. So this is like an approximation what you're seeing here. It's not actually the color. Um, so here is an example of um, like this um, uh, chromaticity diagram with a specific uh, gamut. Um, and here are a couple of other um, like, uh, gamuts from, from various devices. So you can have things like uh, CMYK here, hexachrome, there's sRGB, and then there's an Adobe RGB version, which is a little bit uh, bigger. So these are the, this, the, these different computer color models that you'll be using in a computer. So we won't be going much deeper into these because for visualization it's, it is kind of important but it, it gets uh, tricky really fast and you can actually, with a couple of simple guidelines, you can use it pretty well. So what is a color map? What do I mean by when I talk about color maps? How do I encode data with color? So we specify a mapping between color and values. So we have a couple of different um, color maps. You can have categorical color maps, ordered color maps, sequential, divergent color maps, Segmented versus continuous color maps, univariate versus bivariate, and so on. So here is a bint, uh, discrete color map that, is, has a, that maps to a, a, a continuous interval from 0 to 8. But we can't see every shade here, we only see like, uh, the integers basically here. This would be like a categorical color map. Uh, we can't really order between those colors. And I'll be going, coming back to this. Here is another sequential color map. This is a diverging color map. So here we have like a neutral point in the middle and then higher values up here and then lower values up here, uh, down here. Um, this would be a continuous version of that same color map. Um, or here is like um, a categorical color map again. So the problem is with colors is that we, we perceive millions and millions of colors but we, it's really hard to tell them apart. So for example, this here shows you a picture, a graph 
of the internet um, in 2002. Uh, and the problem is that the author of this visualization has chosen to use 22 different colors to show different domains. But the problem is we can only perceive seven or eight or nine different colors reliably. We can only distinguish these, like a very limited number of colors reliably. So here we have, for example, five shades of green. We can clearly distinguish them when they're close to each other, when they're really immediately approximate, like in, a, in immediate proximity. But if like, you cannot tell me like which of those greens here is this one versus which of those greens is this one. So this is not a good color map. So you should use only six or seven or maybe eight uh, colors in practice. Um, of course you can use this for labeling and this is a, a screenshot of a nice website it's called Color Brewer and um, you will be hearing more about that. We'll be using this a lot because this gives you good If you want to do quantitative data visualization with color is uh, we shouldn't use value. We should use saturation uh, but uh, uh, we should use saturation, we should use value, but we shouldn't use hue, sorry. The problem with hue is, um, here we have like a continuously increasing field, um, and we can see if we use value, uh, this is very obvious that this is a continuously increasing field. If you use something like a rainbow color map, where we try to emulate essentially the um, electromagnetic spectrum, um, what we get are these gradients that are actually not there in the data. So this helps us to kind of bin this data set, but it kind of introduces those wrong gradients. And very many of these rainbow color maps, they don't are equally spaced, they're not equally spaced. So you can see here that the green is much wider than the yellow. And this is kind of arbitrary. Why should it be like that? And so there's many downsides to that. Um, so the rainbow color map is something that is very dangerous. So here's an example um, of the same data of a flow data set um, with a rainbow color map and one with a, with a value color map. And so you can see the extrema, like the extreme values here uh, quite well on the left, but then it introduces these like wrong artifacts. Yet we see these kinds of charts a lot uh, in scientific publications because they simply, like depends on your task. If you only want to see the highest value, this is actually quite good. But if you want to have a good understanding of the overall data set, um, then something like this is better. Um, so here is just like another example. Um, of rainbow maps versus a value color map, uh, but people have actually studied this. And they have studied what, how well do we like recognize uh, or dis um, distinguish values if we, for example, have to do something carefully, like doing diagnosis in a radi by a, radiolo a radiologist. Um, it's important that this person gets the colors right, right? Um, and so. Um, the, um, there, there have been experiments where with the luminous color maps we can see that in these lower ranges here there is a big source of error so this line here is high but then given like starting here at this level the error is very constant and pretty low so the, um, the perceived values matches to the actual values and so we can make faithful judgments here compared to the rainbow color map um, there is quite a massive error here in the middle and again at the end. So there is simply like we're, we're, uh, we, we lose precision if we use the wrong color map uh, when we do data visualization. Um, a common question is also do I want to have a continuous or a bin color map? Um, and it depends. So this is actually a study done by a PhD student in our group and uh, supervised by Mariah Meyer my colleague, and they have studied whether people are better at using bint color fields, like down here, where you have, this is an elevation map, and this is like a bint color map, so we have like eight or ten bins here, or a continuous color map. And so it turns out that people are faster with the continuous color map, but usually more precise on average with the bint color map. So this is kind of like an ongoing debate, what is really the better uh, approach here. Um, and then, when you use color, you should also be aware that a lot of people are actually colorblind. So 5% roughly of the whole population, 10% of males um, are colorblind, only 1% of females are colorblind. So if you feel comfortable, is anybody in here colorblind? Or has a weakness, a red-green weakness? Nobody? <laughs> I'll test that. <laughs> 
so uh, the theory again is that this is probably due to an X chromosomal recessive inheritance. Uh, red green weakness is very common. Um, the reason is the lack of medium or long wavelength receptors or altered spe uh, spectral sensitivity. So the green shift is the most common. And if we have a rainbow flag, um, this is what it looks like to somebody with normal color vision. Um, if you don't have any green receptors, uh, this is uh, what this map looks like for you, or if you have no red receptors, this is what this map looks like for you. So now I'm testing you. <laughs> uh, this is like one of those tests that you have to go through uh, when you, for example, participate in a perceptual experiment. Um, so, what's the number here? Yes. So everybody who said that now is not red, green, colorblind. Here? So, <laughs> it's a little bit ambiguous. Uh, it's either 73 or, yeah, I'd say 73. 46. 45. <laughs> like have a certain color deficiency um, perceive uh, our environment uh, and actually like, I, did, I don't have a picture of that but there's now glasses that can restore uh, color vision by shifting the wavelength slightly um, and so here is an example of we'll be actually talk about this in more detail but this is a, a figure by the New York Times that essentially shows government spending uh, increased uh, government spending is uh, shown in green and decreased government spending is shown in red but for somebody that, who is red green blind this is simply not a good visualization because we can't tell that apart uh, here is just another example um, and if you ever create a, like a visualization or uh, or like even just a piece of artwork and you want to see if that is actually um, easily recognizable by people with color deficiencies you can go to one of these websites um, upload your data or upload an image uh, and then they will show you how your visualization looks like for these various uh, conditions. Um, you can actually also do this if you use ggplot in R. There's now a library which I just discovered like a couple of days ago uh, where you can uh, plot your original charts for certain, for all of these different uh, color deficiencies. So this is also quite handy. Okay, so Next I'll be talking about how color uh, brightness is relative. It's like we don't have an absolute perception of uh, color. So there's the thing with simultaneous brightness and contrast. So the perceived brightness of an object is always relative to its background. Um, so all of, these, uh, all of these blocks here have the actually is, are the same shade of gray. But we perceive them to be different because they're against a different background. Um, so here is another example. This is called the Chevreux uh, illusion. Um, this is simply like uh, a set of color saturations here. Um, but what we perceive is not what actually is in the data, the stepwise um, function here. But we actually perceive these um, edges as enhanced. Uh, this is like just how our perception, uh, how our perception works. And that can be a problem, especially in computer graphics. Uh, because in the computer graphics, we of course don't have perfect shapes. We always have some kind of triangle mesh. Um, and so uh, what we want to do is we want to use shading that kind of avoids that. And if we had just flat shading, uniform shading, then we would get these like increased effects around the edges here. Um, if we did Goro shading, which is better, uh, we still get these effects because it's not continuous. And if we use Fong shading, uh, which was actually developed here in Utah, um, uh, then we have like this continuous perceived profile in uh, as well. So these uh, Chevreux illusions, they amplify artifacts in computer graphic shape. This is the corn sweet illusion. Which of those two blocks here is darker? Like the ones in the middle. So I hear a lot of this, I hear the same, but it's of course the context here. Like if we uh, put a color in here in between them, we can actually see that they're the same, but we don't perceive them as the same. Like even if we try, they're not, they don't look the same because we make assumptions about light 
about shadows, um, how they fall. And so we assume like a light source here on top, um, and, and then we assume that since this goes back, that this uh, has less light, and therefore we perceive this here to be lighter than the one up here. But in fact, they are the same color. They're just like, because we have this, this, this built-in percept like perceptual model of the environment, um, they, they do look different to us, and it's really, really, like, I can know it, uh, and it still looks the same. There's still, like, there's no way for me to say that these are the same colors. Um, there's a lot of similar examples here. This is a psychologist lab uh, website where you can, flash player. where you can do these kinds of experiments. This is again the, a point that has a consistent, uh, a consistent color, but we perceive it to be lighter at, at the right and then uh, darker um, on the left, just because of the background. But if we put here this thing behind it, we, we obviously see that it is the same color uh, in all of these phases. Um, there's, here's the horn speed effect, um, and there is similar color effect. So, Please go ahead um, and play with that. I have a couple of more examples in this slide. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the dress me. Uh, what's uh, the answer? Is this dress black? Everybody knows that it's, that it's in fact black and blue. But this is exactly this problem. It could be that this, this dress was photographed under a yellow light source or under a blue light source. And depending on that, its actual color is different. And so here is a good example of somebody clipping out this one and moving it. <laughs> so, yeah, just to illustrate that our perception of color is relative. Which uh, of the axis is darker? Left or right? Right. Who thinks to right? <laughs> They're the same. They're the same. Now you know. Uh, you can look at the, uh, um, at the intersections here and you can see there is no difference uh, between them. Uh, those are obviously different colors, right? <laughs> They are actually different colors because we can see the, uh, they're right next to each other. So this one is darker than the other one. But if we separate them, they suddenly look the same. So we can also make colors that are not the same look the same depending on context. So here's an example. This is from an actual, like, um, this is a figure taken from an actual paper. Um, and uh, in, in genetics, it's very common to use these heat maps, uh, these red, blue heat maps or black green uh, or red green heat maps where you shouldn't use red green you should have used red blue but the point here is really that the two fields that are marked with a star here have the same underlying scalar value but we perceive this one here as much higher than this one just because of its environment and this um, this sorting here is likely arbitrary so we are being deceived in interpreting this data set accurately by the surroundings of these um, values. Okay, so now I want to do a design critique. Okay, so here's a chart. And I have a printout for you. I'll be handing this out. Um, and then, um, before I hand this out, uh, this is a chart of, of um, causes of untimely death in the world. And so Bill Gates um, picked this as his graph of the year. I think it was in 2013. And he said, I love this graph because it shows that while the number of people dying from communicable diseases is still far too high, those numbers continue to come down. But there remains much to do to cut down the death in that yellow block even more dramatically. We have the solutions, but we need to keep up the support we try well, where they're being deployed. And so um, now I would like you guys to take a look at these charts. I'll hand them out. There's a couple of questions in here. Uh, team up with your neighbors and uh, discuss the questions on here. The questions are things like, 
what questions does this visualization answer? What design principle uh, best describe why it is good or bad? This is something that we haven't really talked about, but you can speculate. And then give a personal preferences. Why do you like or dislike the visualization? Um, and then we will be discussing this visualization as a group. Uh, and then when we're done with that, uh, you'll have five minutes to create redesigns. And I have paper if you want to sketch. Um, um, and then afterwards, I'll be showing you a professional redesign of this chart. OK. Would you mind helping me hand this out? Thank you. show, uh, how what could you do better, and so on.
chart. What's the data that we see in this chart? Please raise your hands and I'll let one of the other. Yep. So it's a change of percentage annually in the number of deaths in each segment of this disease. Yes, that's a part of the data set. That's correct. Anything else? Uh, the proportion of deaths caused by the three categories. Exactly. So we see the proportions of the three big categories. Anything else? It also, it also gives a relative number of, instead of like, a, the, each block is showing the number and the percentage, like how is it going up or down, and what was the actual count, or the proportion of the counts. Uh, so both. Yeah, I agree with the proportion of the counts. Uh, the actual counts are I not there, but we yeah. can probably like, take a rough guess. Yes. Um, anything else that, like, that's in the data here? The, the three different uh, bars at the bottom, it tells you the increase or decrease in the past five years. Yeah, this is a color legend, right? So it tells us like 43 color, uh, uh, 43 big blocks. This is the color legend here. Um, anything else? There's one special call out here. Uh, for cancer? Yes. So cancer is an additional category here um, because it's a significant chunk, but then we, we distinguish between the subtypes of cancer, um, so cancer is called out. Okay, so how is the data encoded? So let's say, uh, but let's start with how are the, these, these relative um, frequencies of death, how are they encoded? No, I like the, not, not the change, but the actual, like the frequencies. Well, um, basically it's going to tell you that there's been more people dying out of stroke than, let's say, lung cancer, because stroke takes a bigger part of the... Yes, whatever. I would say that the stroke is smaller than the cancers, but... Oh, I mean lung cancer specifically. Yes, I guess one cancer specifically, that's correct. So I heard here the size of the area, that's like what I was uh, looking for. The size of the area gives a, tells us what, uh, what the, um, uh, the relative frequency of these causes of death is. Um, what is color and code? The category. The category and the change, so both are correct. Is this a good color map? No. Why not? Well, there's certain shades. Like, Please read, like. There's certain shades which are like pretty similar. I mean, particularly distinguished, like what's the frequency difference? Yeah. How can you tell minus one percent from one percent? It's really hard to tell in this chart, right? So what could they've done instead? Put the percentage. <laughs> Put specific percentages on the. That would be a possibility. Labeling. Um, yeah, exactly, but I'm trying to get first to something else. Yeah? They could make um, the larger the percentage, the bigger space it takes up on the graph. Yeah, but like, I'm assuming that we're uh, taking, like, keeping the space. I just wanted to, like, because the space encodes something different, right? Um, and we kind of, given that space, we want to encode, we want to use a better color map. Yeah, so we could have two of those, like small multiples. Or you could use two very different colors instead of just black and white, you could use red and green, which are extremely yes. different. Yeah, so you could use a diverging color map with a neutral middle point, right? So you could, instead of using these colors to identify the categories, these categories, you could frame them, and then you could use like uh, red, white, blue, like red being a decrease, white being neutral, blue being an increase. So that would be, um, by not changing this figure too much, that would be a solution to just improve that color map. So, anybody want to tell, like, tell me about whether they like this chart or dislike this chart, and why? It's a good chart that I can do it in a different manner, by stacking the uh, percentage changes like in a single fashion, and uh, zero being the center, and if it's increased, 
stacking on the right yeah. side and decrease put it on the left side. So there, there are other ways to display this data. Um, anybody want to share their opinion? Yeah. So it does not give a clear idea about the proportion of the because some shapes are somewhat equal. Yeah. Exactly, and so it's also one other weakness um, here is what is that? <laughs> There's simply no space for the label, right? Um, so it's not like you can make an argument this is small and therefore not important, therefore I don't need to label it, but there could be a situation where you care about that. Um, I don't like the three dimensional, like, why did they make it three dimensional? The only thing that they put on the third dimension is like the title of the overall. Yes. Group. So there is a 3D effect. There is a it looks fancy. <laughs> <laughs> and the, we will learn that just from a purely perceptual theoretical point of view, 3D is very often not a good choice. Um, it's really hard to make comparisons in three-dimensional space. I have many more examples for you in the rest of this lecture. Um, but on the other hand, there is an argument to be made. This looks cool. If you flip through a magazine while you're waiting for your, in your doctor's office, you might actually pay attention to it, right? And, and what I'm kind of trying to tell you with this is that there is always different motivations of why you want to create a chart and different contexts, different tasks, different people. Um, and there's not one solution that is perfect for everybody. You don't want to have a chart like this in a government report where somebody needs to make a decision based on that because it's not accurate, it's not reliable, it doesn't present information reliably. But if you just want to tell people, hey, infectious diseases are a big problem um, and it's been getting better, then this chart is maybe not the worst ever. Like the color map is terrible, but uh, just making it look nice is not always a sin. And so we'll be talking about um, what's called chart chunk, what we can add like as extraneous elements to make your things look pretty, uh, what is the benefit of that, what are the downsides. There's different schools, um, there's different opinions, and this is what makes this visualization also subjective, right? We have, uh, we can argue about those things, and there are really hot arguments in the community about what is the right approach. Nobody would really argue for that 3D this way is a good approach, but at least it makes people pay attention. Okay, so now um, I want you, everyone, or as a group, I want you to create three different designs, sketching them, uh, of encoding the same data, um, just with your own design. And maybe think of something that is less flashy and more pragmatic. Um, and try to encode all of the data sets. You don't have to finish it up, just like sketch it so that you have an idea. Make sure to encode all of the important data points and then later I'll show you uh, one solution. And I'll be coming through and snapping pictures of your design and maybe if we have time I'll show them on the screen and you can talk about them. <laughs> if anybody needs paper, I've got paper.
What is the on Tuesday after the HTML SVG introduction, but it's important that I do the HTML SVG introduction first because you need this for the homework. Um, and then on Thursday, we will, like, if we don't get to it on Tuesday, we'll discuss it on Thursday and then continue with the perception lecture and then follow up with um, data and data types on Thursday. So, I hope you had a good first week of classes and I'll see you guys on Tuesday.